Well, you may wonder why I chose this topic. If you were here on Wednesday night, and I don't remember who I was even talking to downstairs, uh, I made the comment that I really struggle oftentimes balancing my work with my family life. And so I kind of thought to myself, if maybe there's some areas that I don't have all figured out or that I'm constantly working on, maybe there's somebody else here who struggles with the exact same things. Uh, when I made that comment that you know, I struggle with, with trying to balance work and family life, my wife said I was a workaholic. You know what, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with somebody just admitting that there's an area in their marriage where they need work. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you begin to start listing all those areas you have problems, what you're going to find out is as part of the battle is knowing where you are weak. We can't go back and fix those things that are wrong in our marriage is if we're not willing to step up to the, to the plate and say, you know what, I'm not being very successful here. And so I think each of us needs to be honest with ourselves. And so as I talk today for a little bit about marriage, let me tell you first that I'm not just somebody behind a pulpit talking to you. I'm actually talking to myself. Because as I, as I studied throughout the scriptures this week, I realized, uh, and I looked at some spots, and I thought, that's an area that I'm not being very effective in. So it's something that I need to work on. We need, to, we need to admit and understand that there are many Christian marriages today who are struggling, uh, and it's often due to a lack of understanding. There are many who simply don't know what is needed by their spouse. There's many who have no idea what's even desired by their spouse. And here's what's even worse. Many don't even have the slightest idea what the Bible commands regarding their marriage. So we have to ask the logical question as we start this sermon, how is, a, how is a couple to know how they are to build or to maintain a successful marriage? That's really what we ought to be asking, not as many of us are after we get married. Those are questions we ought to be asking a long time before we get married. But here's the thing, many of us, and if you're like me, you really had no idea what you were getting into. You just didn't. You thought you knew, but you, you really had no idea. And you can't. You, you really can't. But I think we can try to solve some of those problems for those who haven't gotten there yet, and we can go back and try to correct some of those problems for those who are already there trying to figure out how to fix it. We probably ought to also admit that most of us probably didn't see the ideal marriage modeled in front of us. Now, we may have seen our parents do a lot of things right, but we probably also saw a lot of things done wrong. And because of that, some of us bring in incorrect ideas into the marriage. Uh, from the get-go, we have seen examples that really maybe were not biblical patterns. Uh, and oftentimes, it's understandable, right? People do what they've been taught. They do what they've seen take place in front of them. Now, if you were fortunate enough to have that, that perfect set of parents that lived that godly marriage, that's great. Uh, but most of us didn't. Most of us didn't get that. And so we've got to go, we've got to, go to the Scriptures. Now, whether you're here and, and you don't have a spouse and you're looking for one, or whether you're actually married and whether you're trying to improve or, or to maintain or build your marriage, the Bible has the pattern for us. So I want to talk a little bit about building a successful marriage. Um, probably some of the youth are sitting here going, well, I can probably check out on this one because this really doesn't have anything to do with me. You're totally wrong. This, this is probably one of the most important sermons you're going to hear right now. I want you to remember that your spouse is going to come from all of the people that you surround yourself with. It's just logic. Now, you're not going to find that perfect Christian person uh, in a, bunch of, a whole bunch of other people that aren't living like Christians. And so that's the first thing you need to think about. And I know that, that many of you <clears throat> young ladies are probably dreaming about your Prince Charming. But if you're trying to find that perfect man, let me tell you this. Did you know that the most romantic thing that a man can do for you is to treat you like a sister in Christ before you're married and then treat you like a sister in Christ after you're married? And I'm sure you young men also are, are trying to pursue somebody. But I want you to remember this. You need to pursue a lady who's following after Christ. Because if you find a woman who's, who's following after Christ, I assure you you're both going to be on the same path, going to the same place. Now, I want you to remember one more thing, because many of you probably are currently dating. So let's make this very clear. You need to be very selective about who you spend your time with. Because dating is very similar to going to the grocery store without any money. <laughs> and what I mean by that is... is what I mean by that is, is you're either going to leave unhappy or you're going to take something that doesn't belong to you. And you need to think about that. And so you need to be very selective. Now, with that being said, 
Uh, those who are not married, they need to choose the right, the right mate. They need to find the correct spouse. So you ought to be asking yourself, what kind of spouse should I even be looking for? Does the Bible really address it? I preached a sermon on this some time ago. Uh, the Bible very clearly tells us who we ought to marry. Listen to 2 Corinthians 6.14. <clears throat> be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Now you go back and you look at this word communion. It says, what communion hath light with darkness? We're talking about Christians and non-Christians. There, there is no stronger partnership than that of marriage. And so very clearly, we understand that, that Christians are not to be yoked to non-Christians in intimate relationships. It's not to take place. And we understand it logically. Now, if you grew up, uh, and to be honest, most people don't farm like this, but if you grew up in the farm area, you knew a little bit more about yoking. You see, you don't yoke two unlike animals. You don't put an ox next to a, to a donkey, right? Because what happens is, is the, the two animals, they cause that, that yoke to be offset, and it rubs against them, and it causes wounds, and one of them has to work really hard to keep in a straight line, right? Because one of them's pulling them off, the other one's trying to keep straight. When you yoke a Christian to a non-Christian, they rub each other the wrong way. And one of them has to work extra hard to try to keep that marriage in line. It makes perfect sense why we're told not to be yoked to non-believers in an intimate relationship. Here's the point. You need to marry a faithful Christian. Now, many people get this idea that, that romance or, or physical attraction uh, is what it, a marriage is all about. Um, and in doing so, they oftentimes forget about what makes a good spouse, okay? Uh, don't get me wrong, attraction's important, especially for your young people. Attraction's important, but I want you to remember this. When you get 70 years old and your spouse has wrinkles all over, you're going to look at them wrinkles a whole lot differently uh, because there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of trial that caused those wrinkles. And so you need to remember that, that although attraction's important, don't get me wrong, you need to be asking yourself some basic questions. Is this person going to help me get to heaven or are they going to hinder me? That's a basic question that needs to be asked. And just because you're infatuated with somebody doesn't mean that they're going to make a good spouse. It doesn't mean that they're going to make a good mom. It doesn't mean that they're going to make a good dad. We need to ask those basic questions as we're looking for a spouse. And we need to remember that every one of our choices is governed by reason, right? We are creatures of choice. And so our lives are the products of all the choices that we make. And I'm going to tell you, if you choose wrong here, it doesn't just affect you. It affects your spouse, it affects your spouse's family, it affects your family, it even affects if you have children. Now, you may have never thought about this for those of you who aren't married, but I want you to think about it now. You should. You want your children to go to heaven? Probably never thought about that, had you? You better find a spouse that wants their children to go to heaven. Because if you don't, there could be a lot of problems. A lot of problems in a marriage come when one spouse is trying to get to heaven and the other is not. And I want you to remember this. If you can't convert somebody to Christianity before you get married, they may convert you to the world after you get married. That's happened quite often. Another thing we need to talk about before we actually get to marriage is remaining pure until marriage. The Bible makes this very clear. Uh, a Christian is to remain faithful to their spouse even when they don't have one yet. Right? I want you to think about that for a second. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. The only way for one to avoid fornication is to be married uh, when they're involved in physical activities. And so that means prior to marriage, you need to be pure, okay? Um, that Greek word, let me, let me address it for a second. I'm going to be very careful here. The Greek word here where it says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, and it goes on and tells you to be married. There are a lot of people who try to take that word and say that word means this or that word means that. And I'm not going to cover that word here, but I'll tell, I'll tell you this. Don't let, don't let people say that word covers this and that. That word covers everything that I don't want to have to say from the pulpit here. Okay? So if you're trying to get around that word there, there's no way of getting around it. Anything that, that can't be done out in public, is probably included in that, without me having to go into a lot more detail for the youth here. Uh, every one of those things that I don't want to have to say from the pulpit, that's reserved only for your spouse. There's nothing wrong with any of those things as long as they're in marriage. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Now, the world's going to tell you this is old-fashioned. I'm going to tell you it's just purely biblical. 
It's not old-fashioned. That's what the Bible talks about. And there's a bunch of reasons behind it. Now, let me say this. Some remain pure and some don't. But I will tell you, statistics show that if you remain pure until you get married, your marriage has a much higher success uh, rate. Okay? There's no, there's no way to get around those facts. Okay? Remaining pure also protects you from a whole host of consequences that you're not ready to face. Not only are you not ready to face them, you don't want to. And there's, there's a lot of those things that I wouldn't even want to have to discuss from the pulpit. But uh, in reality, we probably should be talking about some of those consequences. You as youth, remember, you can avoid a whole lot of problems by just doing it God's way. Now let me say this very quickly. Because I'm telling you how you ought to do it, but let me acknowledge, some of you may have already messed this up. I hope you, I hope you haven't. But God can and will forgive you when you're willing to repent of it. But your job from now on is to, is to be pure. Uh, I don't need you to come tell me if you messed it up. What I need you to do is straighten it up and fix it with God. And, the, and I'm not just telling you this. I tell this to every people I sit down with as a couple who are married. And I say, I don't want to know what you're doing, but I know you need to be pure. So if you're doing anything you ought not to be doing, you best stop it now. And usually their mouth kind of drops and they put their heads down. I don't want you guys to have to do that. Okay? Uh, for those of you who've determined you're going you're gonna to be faithful until you get married, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you I applaud you. And the world's going to tell you you're missing out, but I assure you, your Christian spouse, they're going to thank you. So let me move on now to actually getting married, once we find that spouse. Most of you are familiar with Genesis 3.24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and he shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. For those of you who are married, I want you to think for just a second right now. If that's not happening, there's a problem. So much so that Jesus goes back and he reiterates this in Matthew 19, 5 through 6. And he said, For this cause shall man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. And what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God's to be the head of the marriage from the very beginning. But the husband and wife are to be so intimate, both both. Physically and emotionally, he goes on and he describes them as one flesh. Now, the husband is told to cleave. <clears throat> and not a word that we, we study a lot, although when I, I mention it, I always try to go back and describe you that that word means to be glued together. It means to be knit together. Any of you guys have a knit sweater? It's hard to unravel that, but, but with that being said, let me tell you this. Even the, even the best knit sweater occasionally needs a men job. I've had knit sweaters get a hole in it, but I tell you what, you can go back and you can fix it. The idea of that word cleave is that nothing's going to be able to dismantle. Nothing's going to be able to pull apart this relationship that you have, okay, this marriage bond. When, I say when, you're faithful to God and to each other. If you're faithful to God and you're faithful to each other and you are knit together like you're supposed to be, the world's not going to come in and pull that apart. But unfortunately, we do find where the world does come in and pull that apart. And it comes in many different forms of temptations. This word cleave is the exact same word which shows our commitment to God and Christ. But doesn't the world sometimes come in and cause us to leave that commitment? It does it both for Christians in their commitment to God and Christ, and it also does it oftentimes in regard to their marriage. Acts 11.23 it says, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with the purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. You're supposed to cleave to your spouse like that, right? If you are cleaving to, to your spouse the way you ought to be cleaving to God and the Lord, I assure you nobody's going to come in and tear that marriage apart. But when a marriage comes apart, somebody, somebody has messed up somewhere, right? Somewhere there is sin involved. Now, uh, unfortunately, what we see on TV is not normally good examples, right? How often do you see a fully functional marriage on TV nowadays? Can anybody remember seeing a fully fu If I were to go back and think about all the sitcoms and shows I've watched, and I'll be honest, I think the last functional marriage that I recall seeing may have been in the Cosby show. Is that maybe the last one that was a decent marriage that seemed where everything was set up the way it ought to be set up? Usually the husband's the butt of the joke, right? That's how marriages are portrayed on TV today. Uh, and, and divorce is portrayed as, hey, it's no big deal. It's so common. We hit a rough patch, so you know what? Let's just chuck it and go the other way. That's not what the Bible teaches us. Um, divorce should never be considered an option. 
uh, when things are going bad. With that being said, though, let's understand there are situations such as infidelity that can break the marriage bond. But that's the only, that's the only example you have, or the, the only time you're allowed to leave a spouse uh, is because of that. You'll find that in Matthew 19, 1 through 9, Matthew 5, 32, and a host of other verses, okay? So if you're thinking about leaving a spouse, which I don't assume anyone here is, but if you're thinking about leaving a spouse and infidelity is not involved, somewhere sin has entered into your marriage, somewhere, because that is never an option. And now, as I was thinking about this sermon, somebody had told me the account of newlyweds. This might ring a bell for some of you that are married. They've been married about a month or so, and they got into an argument. I mean, a drop-down, slug-it-out argument. And she called her dad, or she called her mom, her mom answered first, and she said, you know, this guy's a, he's a jerk. And she was complaining, and her mom's listening to her, and her mom said, let me put your dad on the phone. So dad got on the phone, and she went on complaining and telling about this argument that they had, and she said, I want to come home. And the father said, you're exactly right. You need to be at home. But guess what? That's where you are, okay? You're at home right now. That's where you need to be, so you best find a way to fix it, okay? Spouses that cleave never leave. And I don't care how bad the argument is, that's never an option. And I'm going to tell you something else. When you get married, it doesn't matter if you guys have an argument like that. You always tell your children, listen, sometimes mommies and daddies, we're going to argue. But mommies and daddies never leave. They need, to, they need to hear that from a very little age. So when they see you argue, if you argue, that's already put out of their mind. Uh, nobody wants to grow up wondering and, and fearing that their parents may separate. I'm talking about Christian parents that are trying to do the right thing. You know, that's something you can take away real quick. And I'm going to assure you, though, when, when parents are trying to live according to the Bible, I don't care how bad it gets, uh, they can fix those problems. So one of the things we've got to do is we've got to cleave to each other. We have to be knit and glued together. We have to demonstrate that for our children so they can, one, grow up knowing how a, how a marriage ought to interact, but two, that takes away the fear of, of them ever losing a parent, okay? Listen to Ecclesiastes 4.12. Most of you probably have heard this verse. And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That threefold cord in your marriage, God, a faithful wife, and a faithful husband. All wrapped up together, right? When one of those cords gets broke, there's a serious problem, and it needs to be fixed. But it can be when spouses are trying to live according to God's plan. So let me spend a few minutes talking about that. I'm going to tell you each of these points, I could have covered a whole lot more material than we're going to be able to today. But let's talk a little bit about God's plan for the family. God has a plan for all husbands. Listen to Ephesians 5.25. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here in Ephesians and in Colossians. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands are the spiritual leaders of the family. Okay? Man, you need to understand something. You are the catalyst both for love and for biblical direction in the marriage. You're the catalyst. Uh, you're going to find out that husbands are told, love, love, love. You go back and you're not going to find that same emphasis placed on the wife, okay? Husbands, love, love, love. You know what? A wife's drawn to a husband that loves her. You're going to find that the scriptures tell you exactly what you need to do to cause your wife to react. Listen to Ephesians 5.28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. You want to go to heaven? You want your wife to go to heaven? You love by leading. That is the only way your wife and you and your children are going to have the best shot of going to heaven is if you love by leading. Listen to Colossians 3.19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You see a pattern going on here when he talks to husbands? Why is the emphasis on husbands to love? The reason is, is because... That's how, our, that's how our wives are built. Our wives will love us in return if we will just love them first. I go back and I think about Christ. He loved first, didn't he? When they didn't love him. When, when they were treating him harshly, he loved them. Uh, when, when things seemed to be at their worst for him and yet he still loved them. And I'll be honest with you, um, I think most of us struggle here, don't we? 
When things are at their worst, is love what you're thinking? It's really, it's usually how can I get that zinger in and that argument that we're having, right? How can I think up the meanest thing that I can say to them to really just get them? Let's just be honest. That's what we do. Now, as Christians, we'd say, oh, no, I don't do that. Yeah, you do. You do it. I know you do it, and I've done it too. Here's the thing we've got to remember. Love's not a choice. Love is a reaction. We choose to love or we don't choose to love. Those are the only two options, right? There's no such thing. How many people have heard I, I fell out of love with him? There is no such thing as falling out of love with somebody. Here's the options. I love them according to the, as the Bible says to love them, or I choose not to love them according to how the Bible tells me to love them. There is no, I hear Yoda going on in my head. There is no that I choose to love or I choose not. There is only you can love them according to the Bible going on, right? And yet you'll hear people say that all the time. I just fell out of love with him. I'm going to tell you what, a husband who loves his wife, he's not going to abuse his position as a leader in the marriage. His leading is going to be based on God's will. Uh, he's going to have his best interest for not only his bride, but for the children. And everything that he does is going to be, uh, it should be done in their best interest, right? So let me tell you this, whether you want to be the leader or not, whether you're comfortable being the leader or not, you're the leader. No ifs, ands, or buts. If you're not comfortable with it, start getting comfortable with it. You have no other choice. You are the leader. And if you're not leading, you're going to have to step up, all right? As a matter of fact, she wants you to lead. She needs you to lead. She needs you to be the one who steps out front and leads. And I'm going to tell you why. Because that's how God designed it. She expects and wants you to be the leader. Now, there may be a, a woman here who's married who says, you know what, I, I don't need my husband to lead to feel safe and secure. Well, the last time you heard that noise in your house at 2 o'clock in the morning, who got up? You hit him, right? Go get up, right? Husbands do give physical and spiritual protection, and they do that through leadership. I know many women have come to me and said, my husband is not leading, and I'm angry. This isn't a one-time thing. This is something I've heard over and over and over again. My husband is not leading, and I resent him for it. So ask yourself as a male who's here right now who's married, have you been leading? Because if you have not been, you are forcing her to take upon herself a role that God did not design her for. Okay? She may be doing it, but that's not how it was, that's not how it was planned. And I want you to listen to this as I get ready to move on to the next section. Men, the condition of your wife reflects to the world your faith and what kind of man you are. Let me say that again very carefully. The condition of your wife reflects to the world your faith and what kind of man you are. You look at somebody's wife and, and you start to look at them. If they're down, if they're broken, if they're fearful, if they're hurt, if they seem to flinch, Oftentimes, that's because the husband's fallen short somewhere. I say oftentimes, not always. Sometimes the problems are because of her own sin. Let's talk for, for wives for just a second, because God does have a will for wives. In Ephesians 5, 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. That's not a politically correct statement right there, is it? People don't like to hear that. Uh, that makes some people angry. I've had people come to me before and ask me to do a little research on that. Let me tell you, ladies, if that verse offends you in the English, let me help you out just a little bit. Let me clarify it in the original language. Because Paul here is addressing Christians, uh, Christian wives in verse 24, and that word everything in the Greek means this. Everything. All. Every. The whole. He's talking about every single thing pertaining to, uh, to what the husband says, that's what's, that's what's supposed to go. Now, you may be asking the question, why would that be the biblical standard? Because the husband is to be the spiritual leader in the house, right? And if a husband is a Christian man behaving as the, the Bible tells him to behave, he's not going to tell you to do anything that would be for your harm, right? He's going to tell you everything that should be done for your good. Is that always the case in a marriage? It's not. Should it be the case in a marriage that a husband should be leading according to the Bible and telling... And, and making decisions based solely on your behalf. Now, let me make this very clear. 
That doesn't mean that a husband gets up today and says, today you wear the red socks and tomorrow you wear the yellow ones. That causes a whole host of problems, right? How many women would listen to their husbands if he was picking out their socks in relation to their clothing? I'm not talking about stuff like that. Now, I don't determine exactly what you do every single minute of your day. A Christian husband wouldn't do that. Who would want that undue pressure put on them? And not, and not to mention, there's no need to do that. She can make her own decisions. We're talking, about, we're talking about things regarding direction, spiritual direction, things for safety, all of those things. There's no need for anybody to micromanage anybody. I used to run a company, and I would always tell people when I hired them, if I have to micromanage you, you're fired. I don't do micromanagement. We don't do micromanagement in marriages either, okay? Uh, that's something to remember. A Christian husband's not going to put unnecessary demands on his, on his wife. And any decision that he does make is going to be for the best of his wife and the children. But let me tell you this. As a spiritual leader of the family, he may make a decision that you don't agree with. And guess what? He may be wrong. And as the spiritual leader of the family, he is responsible for that decision when he's wrong. You're responsible to let him lead, and if he's wrong, that's his problem, okay? You go along with it. He's responsible for it, not you. Now, it is not a burden for the church to be subject to Christ. You go back to Ephesians 5, 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. It wasn't a burden for the church to be subject to Christ. It shouldn't be a burden for a, for a wife to be subject to her husband. It's God's will. Now, the reason that this causes so much problem is because, I'm going to be honest, so many men are doing it wrong. That's why there are so many women that are offended by this verse, because there are so many men who are doing it wrong. If all of us were doing it right, I don't think this would be as problematic. But I will tell you this, a woman who follows the Bible will gladly follow a husband who is led by the Bible, right? Because she knows that he's going to do everything uh, for her best behalf. Next, we understand that the church's security is in Christ. A wife's security should be in that of her husband. Now, let me address something else here because I, I know I've seen this take place before. It doesn't matter if your wife is the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and you have the lowliest, most pathetic job in the community. When you come home, God's pattern takes over. Okay? Roles are reversed. I don't care if she's the President of the United States and you clean the toilets for the President of the United States. When you come home, the pattern for the home takes over. We need to remember that, that the husband is to be uh, the spiritual leader at the home. Now, some will ask this question. What if my husband doesn't make decisions based on the Bible? Does anybody know somebody that does that? It happens. Most of us have heard the examples of, of the, the Christian lady whose husband said, you know what, you ain't going to church. You're not going to church. Well, first let me say that it's a shame that that stuff does happen, okay? Your question may be then, well, what do I do? Listen to Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. You submit yourself to your husband's leadership according to God's will. And yet I want you to remember this. All Christians are faithful to God before they are faithful to anybody else, anything else, and that includes even even laws made by our government. We're faithful to God first. If you have an unfaithful spouse or if you have a non-Christian spouse, you do what God says to do first. You are to be obedient uh, and follow and let your husband lead, but when he says to do something and it's not in alignment with the Scriptures, you're going to follow what God says to do first. Okay. Now, let's also acknowledge this. There are some Christian wives whose, whose husbands are either not Christians or they're not faithful Christians. So what do you do? You follow him when God's law allows it. You follow God's law when, when it doesn't allow it. And you convert your spouse through showing your fear and reverence of, of God and his word, while at the same time being faithful and in, in, uh, letting your husband be the leader. And I'm going to tell you that's really hard to do. I've talked to to many a lady who have struggled with the fact that at the time or uh, whatever, their, their husband was not being a spiritual leader. And, and I'm going to address that here in a second. I know that can be tough, but I've also seen it work, okay? You can, you can change your non, uh, 
believing spouse's mind by the way you interact, both as a husband and as a, as a wife. Listen to 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2. Now, this is one of the best examples we can go to. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation or manner of life of the wives, while they, can, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. What we're being told here actually works with non-Christians and Christians. Okay? It can work both ways. Now, it's interesting as I read that, you know, I, I look at that and, and can take a little bit of uh, personalness from that because I can remember there was a time when I had decided to follow my wife who was trying to follow God. I wasn't a Christian. Uh, as a matter of fact, she wasn't either. We were trying to get it figured out, but she was the spiritual leader. She'll tell you. Uh, she was a spiritual leader. She'll also tell you she resented me for not being a spiritual leader. But there was a time when I decided I would follow her. It's kind of like you guys ever see the, the lady walking on the street and she's in front and the husband's behind going like this. People always, people always laugh about it. There was a time I decided to do that. Interestingly enough, eventually I got up next, next beside her. I was walking behind her at first, but eventually I got up to where I was walking even with her. You know what happened after a little bit more study? Eventually I got to the point where I realized that it was time for me to step out. Do you think I was comfortable doing that? No. If you're a husband here and you're not leading because you're not comfortable, I know how you feel. But guess what? You don't get that choice. You step out and get in front and get comfortable with it. That's your only choice you're allowed to have. Now, let me say this. If you're a Christian woman and you're in this position, whether you're married or whether you're not married, and you don't have a leader, uh, then this is what you do. You follow Christ and you allow your children to see His example in you. That's who you decide to follow. And as I was thinking about this, I went back and I, I thought about Timothy. You remember Timothy, who we read so much about in the Bible, and I began to think about that relationship he had and what we knew about his family. Because you go back and you learn anything about Timothy, and you, you learn that his father was a Greek. He was a Gentile. It appears that he wasn't even a Christian. We're not given a whole lot of information, but I'll tell you what we do know. We know his mother and his grandmother were Christians. I'm going to tell you, Christian mothers who may not have leaders, your influence is important. It's needed. And it can be effective. You see the example there with Timothy. Well, let me move on past the roles of husbands and wives, and I barely just touched the surface there. Let's talk about withholding love and affection. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5 forbids this. You may say, why? Well, I'm going to tell you, it causes a whole lot of undue temptation on the spouse. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, it also drives a, a wedge in the marriage bond. When a, when, when, a, when a marriage is already struggling and you don't want to have anything to do with your spouse, it just drives a wedge in there farther and farther and farther. Um, each spouse needs to admit that they have different requirements. Okay, And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details here, but uh, some spouses need a whole lot of physical affection and some don't. And so when he makes this statement here, uh, he's doing this because, guess what? The only, the only source that you have to give your affection to is your spouse. And if your spouse withdraws from you, that causes a whole lot of problems. You see, how the, you see how the wedge gets bigger and bigger? Because what happens when you and your spouse aren't talking? And one of them kind of pulls back a little bit. The other one gets even more angry. So what do they do? They pull back a little bit more. You see how the wedge just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And then when you get that mad at each other, you don't even want to be around each other. You see how the wedge keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger? So Paul tells us how to fix it. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. He's much better at, at wording stuff sometimes than I am. He says, render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. He says, you know what, don't be defrauding your spouse. Now, that word defraud means to withhold yourself. He's talking about husbands and wives. This command is for both husbands and wives. Like I, already, I already mentioned, people are different. One spouse may need lots of little hugs and kisses, and the other one may not need any. Okay? You need to get that figured out, and you need to get your schedules on path. That's what he's telling you to do here. And he says, don't withhold yourself at all except for time of fasting or prayer. 
Let me pause here for a minute. You know how many times I've been asked about this in the last two months? Let's talk about this for just a second. Somebody made the statement the other day, you in the churches of Christ don't teach about fasting, or you don't believe in fasting. I heard, I heard that. Then I had someone come ask me, what about fasting? Uh, I've had this question asked a bunch of times. It's interesting when you go back and you look at the scriptures. Jesus talked about fasting quite often, and his was related to the, to the Jews, at least, uh, and it was mentioned under the Jewish dispensation. However, if you go and you look at Christians, first century Christians, who were fasting, you're going to find about 20 different references to first century New Testament Christians who were fasting. It was always done in regard to something religious taking place, whether it was persecution, whether it was a temptation, a trial, the list goes on and on. And it is assumed that we as Christians at some point would fast. We're not commanded to do it, and we're not told when to do it, but we are told how to do it. And the reason you may not know anything about it is because if you're fasting and you want to listen to what Jesus told you in Matthew 6, you don't go around talking about it. So I don't crawl in here into the building on my forearms going, man, I've been fasting for the last 18 hours, and man, what I wouldn't give for a bag of chili corn chips, right? You don't do that. <laughs> so you wouldn't know if I was fasting or not because I wouldn't talk about it anyways. But that idea of the Church of Christ doesn't deal with fasting, we don't talk about it, we don't teach it, he says right here, don't defraud yourself from your spouse except for a time of fasting and prayer. It's interesting that most people when they get married believe they're going to spend time with their spouse. So why wouldn't they believe at some point in their life they might have a time of fasting and prayer? Okay? He doesn't tell you when to do it. He tells you how to do it. His point was this. Don't, don't withhold yourself from your spouse and cause some type of a, a wedge to be driven in there uh, in between the two of you. Now, for many marriages that struggle, I'm just going to be honest with you, this is a primary uh, area of resentment in the marriage. Let's just say uh, they're not on the same path. We're not on the same page here, okay? Uh, my desires aren't met and your, your desires and maybe you don't care. and People start to get angry. Now, for many, um, they just don't understand this. Let me try to give you a little information why there's so many problems here. Men, let me tell you a little secret. Uh, your wife would be a whole lot more affectionate to you if you loved her as described in Ephesians 5.25. Here's the problem. When you say the word love, men and women don't hear that word the same. So let me try to break it down a little bit to you. And again, I'm still trying to get all this worked out myself. When the wife talks about love, uh, she associates that with love and intimacy throughout the day. Talking about the, the way that we treat her, the things that we do. And she responds to the way we treat her throughout the day later in the day. Okay? That's how it works. If we make her angry during the day, she's going to be angry later. Okay? Uh, I'm trying to get this broke down as simple as can be. Now, ladies, I know that you love your husbands based on what you do for your children and all the stuff you do around the house and maybe if you have a job and all that. However, men are not very complicated. Men associate love with physical touch. So I began to think about this in a logical way. I know that all of you as wives are extremely busy. But if a husband has to choose between the physical touch of his wife or the laundry getting done, he will wear a dirty shirt to work tomorrow and be happy about it. So sometimes not everything's going to get done around the house. I understand that. Does that sometimes aggravate us as husbands? Yeah. So what? Uh, we're not perfect and neither are you. We all have our own little bickers. What I'm saying is try to prioritize. If your thing is always getting work done late at night, maybe you shouldn't be doing some of that stuff at night. Maybe you need to move it to later in the morning. Okay? Here's my point, and I tried to simplify it as, as much as I can. Men and women don't necessarily think the same. Okay? And we've got to try to get on the same, uh, the same level of understanding. And Paul, as he's talking about this and trying to get us to understand all this, is saying, in particular, don't use love as a weapon to punish your partner. Don't withhold yourself. And the reason is because of all the different things that it causes. I'm going to tell you, this is the number one tactic used when I'm angry. It is. This is the number one thing that somebody can do to say, I'm mad at you right now, and I'm going to show you. Here's the problem with that. This doesn't in any way fix anything. When I'm angry at you and you're angry at me and we just 
turn our backs on each other. You know what that does? That doesn't fix anything. Uh, all it does is drive the wedge in there deeper and deeper and deeper, as I already talked about. I've mentioned to you before, when you're angry, physical touch goes a long way in fixing the problem. You can't be angry at somebody if you're giving them a hug. You might be at first, but eventually that goes away. And so if there's problems in your, whenever I have somebody come in and tell me I'm struggling in my, in my marriage, I always tell them the first thing to do, try to increase physical touch. I don't care if you're just holding her hand. Uh, I don't care what you're doing. That will help fix the problem. So Paul makes this very clear. Don't withhold affection in the marriage. He goes on, we learn in Philippians 2, 3, that we need to listen to one another. Boy, this is an area that causes a lot of trouble, right? This right here, listening to one another, leads to virtually every other problem that we've tried to address so far. Because when something's not being done right, this is usually uh, what has to do with it. We're not listening to each other, or there's a problem in our communication. Philippians 2, 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You know, when we in a marriage esteem our spouse, uh, we want what's best for them. We're going to listen to them, and we're going to hear what their desires are, what their needs are, and guess what all that requires? Communication, and a little bit of communication, and a little bit of communication, and then just a little bit more communication. Now, this is why the silent treatment doesn't work. We just talked about that. Not only is there a wedge drawn in there, there's no communication going on. Let me address the men for a minute, because if the men were uh, raised kind of like me, this may not go over quite so smoothly. Men, communication involves feelings. We don't like to talk about feelings, right? Let's just admit that right now. If you're not in touch with your feelings, then you can't communicate your feelings. Now, if you were raised like me, here's the only two times you ever communicated feelings. One, when you smashed your thumb with a hammer, or two, when someone died. That's how I was raised. You don't cry unless someone dies. You don't even cry when you smash your thumb with a hammer. There's a whole bunch of other ways you express that. That's how I was taught to, that's how I was taught to express emotion. You don't cry unless somebody dies. That's it. Uh, and it's okay to get angry if something's not working out right. Um, that's not a real good way of trying to communicate. I still, I still struggle with that. I was raised, if something doesn't work out, it's okay to get very loud, boisterous, and that's how you deal with it. That's not always the preferred method, so I'm still having to retrain myself. We ought to be able to talk with our spouse at any time, honestly and openly, while we speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 5. Now, with all that being said, uh, we need to understand that's not always easy. Sometimes you may be talking about something that either one, you're shy about, or two, you're embarrassed about. Well, let's just stop that right now. If you're talking with your spouse, there really ought not to be anything you can't discuss. There should be nothing that you should be too shy to talk about or too embarrassed to talk about, okay? And so you need to, you need to be able to sit down and discuss whatever it is, uh, including everything. Let's just make it that simple. I don't care if you're embarrassed or shy. Uh, you need to be able to deal with it. Let's remember that every person in the house, that includes the children, should have the right to express themselves. In our house, the way it worked was I was allowed to express myself once. Once I was told to stop, that's when the expressing themselves got stopped, okay? But everybody should be able to try to express themselves. Even the youth uh, in your house, they should, have the, they should have at least one opportunity. I may get a point where you say, that's not right, or stop. Now, when you start talking about husbands and wives, that's a whole different interaction because the husband's trying to make decisions as a leader, and he needs to be able to communicate not only with, with the spouse, but also with the children so that he can make the best biblical decision for the entire family. I'm not saying you'll like his decision, but he needs everyone's input to make that decision. That, that again, involves communication. With all that being said, and this is especially important for us as men, I want you to remember this. Sometimes thinking's better than speaking. And we covered this, I think, just a few, this weekend. Listen to Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Listening is important, okay? It's extremely important. So is talking in love. So is knowing when you shouldn't say anything at all. There are times when the idea pops in your head, and unfortunately what often happens is it just comes out. Especially in marriage, what we need to remember is, is when it goes in, we ask ourselves, we filter it and go, is this going to help or is this going to hurt? 
Maybe I have no reason to even bring that up. I'll just not talk about that. There's no reason to even get that going, okay? Sometimes that is what needs to be done. Just because I think it doesn't mean I need to say it. Sometimes I need to keep that in. If it's not going to help, it may actually hurt. With all that being said, that needs to be included in the whole entire communication process. Because if we can't communicate, we can't work on the marriage. Next, I want every one of you to have a sorry marriage. What I mean by that is, is you need to have a marriage where you're in an environment where you can come and say sorry to each other uh, and, and do it in a way according to the Bible. This is something we need to get good at. It's something that we're not often good at when we get married, but oftentimes we're much, much better at it by the time we've been married for a long time. Okay? James 5.16, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We confess our faults to our spouse when we say we're sorry, uh, but we need to be sincere and we need to really mean it. Uh, when we're wrong, we apologize and we try to make improvements in the area, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that you're not going to make that same mistake another 55 times. And we'll talk about that down here in a second. As spouses, we, we need to be willing to forgive the one that we cleave to, even when we get extremely, extremely angry. Luke 17, 4, And if he trespassed against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. I bet that's actually happening in a marriage somewhere. <laughs> seven times in a day, same thing. Uh, when you're wronged by your spouse, you forgive them because you love them. I don't care if it's the 20th time that they left their dirty clothes and dirty underwear on the floor when you have told them not to do it. You still forgive them if they're sincere, all right? Uh, it doesn't matter if... You come in and they've got the, the, how about the dirty whiskers in the sink, right? How many of you hate that? When your husband shaves and he doesn't clean the sink, and you guys smiling, it happens all the time. How about if she drives the car for three months without telling you the engine light's on and turns it into a two-ton paper, paperweight? That's never happened in my marriage, but how angry would you be? Right? Oh, that just makes the whiskers thing small. Well, Matthew 18, 21 through 22, if she comes home and the, the car is now a two-ton paperweight because the engine light's been on for two weeks, or uh, if, he's done, if, he's, if he washed your favorite clothes and then he dried it in the dryer instead of hanging them up and now none of them fit, what do you do? Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive, forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until... 70 times 7. You're going to hit that 490 mark at some point in a faithful marriage. It's going to happen. It may happen at the 18-year mark. It may happen at the 2-year mark for some marriages, but it may also happen much later in life. But you're going to hit that mark at some point. So what do you do when you hit the number? Because I actually remember a guy in class going, so what happens when you hit 491? You continue to forgive when they sincerely repent. All right? Uh, here's the other thing. I'm going to bring this up real quick, and then I'm going to move on. When one of the spouses messes up, and I don't care, we just talked about sin, how all sins equal, okay? Consequences are not, but sins equal. When a spouse says they are sorry, sincerely, and repents of it, and you say you forgive them, you never, 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 never bring it up again. Because if you continue to bring it up in your next argument, you didn't actually forgive them. They may have sincerely repented of it, but if every time you argue, you go, oh, yeah, well, what about? You didn't forgive them. So if you sincerely forgive your spouse when they sin and mess up and they sincerely repent, you don't bring it up ever again. Okay? That's going to go a long way in solving problems. Next, you need to help your spouse and your family go to heaven. Husbands do this by leading according to the Bible. Is it going to assure that every one of your spouses is going to get to heaven? No. But that's your job. Your job is to create an atmosphere where your wife is in a better position to be faithful, where your children are in a better position to be faithful. That is your, that's your most important thing that you can do. I'm going to tell you, I, I, because I started off telling you, I, I have a problem with balancing work uh, and family life. And I know a lot of preachers who have lost their families while they were trying to save others. So I struggle with that because I'm not doing well there. We as Christian husbands, our main priority is to get our families to heaven, okay? Nothing's to come in the way of that. With that being said, we also don't want any of our other family members, extended family, to, to go 
uh, to go to hell. We want them to be saved. We also want our neighbors to be saved, right? Th this continues to just branch out from our family. Our focus is our family, but it branches out to, to the next door neighbors and everybody else. Well, here's the point. If we're living a Christian life, we're going to be different than the world. Listen to 1 Peter 2.9. <clears throat> that ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. As spouses, have you been called out of the world? Do people look at you and say, that's the way, the, that's the way Christian marriage ought to be? Uh, are you different than everyone else? Are you faithful in attendance? Are you faithful in the work for the Lord? Are you trying to teach other people? How to come to Christ? I'm going to tell you, if your marriage is struggling, sin has infiltrated somewhere. And I couldn't have covered all of the areas today. There are some ways you can fix that. Uh, you, need to be, you need to be praying together and studying the Bible together, especially if you're having a disagreement on something based around the Bible itself. What better place to fix it than going to the Bible itself? If you're not happy with the way things are going, you need to be going to the Scriptures and saying, this is how we're supposed to fix it. Spouses who cleave never leave, okay? You've got to get that figured out. The only way to, to fix those problems is to go to the Scriptures. Now, we'll go back to Psalms 127.1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. You can build a house that's going to serve the Lord, but you're going to have to do it according to the pattern. We have patterns all throughout uh, the world that we live in, right? There was a pattern used to build your physical house. There was a pattern used to make the clothes that we wear. There was a pattern used to, to make the cars that we drive around. There is a pattern set forth to guide our marriage, and that's the Bible. You want your marriage to be good? It can be. You need to be using the pattern of the Bible. I want you each to ask yourself, are you willing to work? Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to love? Are you willing to endure through all the trials? Are you willing to repent when you've messed up? Are you willing to forgive the one who's repented when they've messed up? You start to put all that into action, and I, I assure you your marriage can be good. But I'm going to tell you what, if you want to have an effective marriage, you want to be effective in the kingdom, none of that's ever going to happen until you become a Christian. Until you become a Christian according to the Word of God and then live faithful according to the Word of God. It's very simple. Uh, you need to believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that He was the Messiah, and that He came and He shed His blood so that you would have the hope of forgiveness of sins, Hebrews eleven six. 6. And because you understand that, you're more than excited to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3, and Acts 17, 30. You're more than excited to confess the name of Christ, Romans 10, 9, and 10, Matthew 10, 32, and 33. And you are more than excited to be baptized by immersion for the remission of sins, Mark 16, 16. All so that you can come into contact with the blood of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4. But it's not enough. You've got to be faithful afterwards. And I'm going to tell you, for those of us who are married, almost all of that we're talking about pertaining faithfulness, it's somehow tied into our marriage. If our marriage is not effective, then something is infiltrated into our marriage and is slowly drawing us away. It could be people that we're associated with that we ought not to be associated with. It could be practices we're associated with that we ought not to be with. The list goes on and on. But I assure you, if you go back to the Word of God and you rely on what He said, I guarantee your marriage will be fixed. And if your marriage isn't that bad right now, I'll tell you, if you go back to the Word of God and continue to improve on it, it's going to get better. And that's what I hope for this congregation is that each of us will strive, starting with this new time of the year, to build our marriages, to make them better, to make them stronger. And you know why? Because let's just admit that not everybody in the congregation at, at the exact same time is having a great marriage. So who do they go to for support? Other Christians. It's our job as other Christians to help other Christians. We have our struggles and so do they. We need to rely on each other. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, please don't leave without being baptized and talking to me. If you're here and, and you're struggling in any way, maybe in your marriage, maybe in some other way, we want to pray for you. Uh, and you can make that known as we stand and sing a song of invitation.